Hello and welcome to another day at the Time Slit Fest. The Light of Asia, written by Sir Edwin Arnold, was a poetic masterpiece, first published in 1879. Today, we have Mr. Jairam Ramesh, well-known economist and politician and an extraordinary author whose latest book, The Light of Asia, unravels and narrates the story of this phenomenal poem that has so deeply influenced our thoughts about the great sage and his teachings. In conversation, we have writer, television producer, director, and documentary filmmaker, Mr. Rajiv Mehrotra. I'm delighted to welcome you to the Times Literary Festival and a conversation with the uh, author of The Light of Asia, the poem that defined the Buddha. I'm Rajiv Mehrutra. Uh, the author, Jairam Ramesh, is an economist and a, a very sort of unlikely politician, a member of the Rajya Sabha of the Congress Party. Uh, he's the author of more than a dozen books, including biographies of Indira Gandhi, P. N. Haksa, and B. K. Krishna Menon. Uh, this latest book of his, uh, which has been a rage, uh, it has been widely reviewed and uh, everywhere that I look, uh, in the press and on television and on uh, uh, the internet, there are these uh, innumerable interviews uh, with uh, Jairam Ramesh, and quite understandably and naturally, because it's a brilliant book and he is a brilliant uh, author. Uh, I have to say I'm completely in awe of you, as I, sa as I said in the introduction and the book, that... Uh, the kind of research that you have brought into this a juxtaposition of the biography of uh, uh, the poem and the author, in which I must sort of say that the poem comes out looking a lot better than the author, uh, but uh, uh, the scale is, and, and, and the depth of that uh, study is awesome, and that you did it during the, uh, the COVID academic uh, and, you know, you're know, looking up the, the list of books in Queen Victoria's collection, Winston Churchill's letter to Nehru referring to him as a light of Asia, and then going through all the sort of the labor of finding out if he had read the light of Asia and referred to the book or not. Uh, you know, copies of Government of India filed as to the, on the debate on whether it's uh, literature or religion, and, you know, tracing his uh, descendants in India. And uh, even a palm print of Edwin Allen. Uh, so you have really sort of taken the, uh, how do I put it, uh, taken the skin off the, uh, the great aura that you know, someone like me had associated with Edmund or, uh, Edwin Allen when I uh, uh, you know, read the poem. Um, so, I mean, here's someone, you've, you've spent uh, so much time and energy uh, in this book, and you must have obviously discovered and read it a very long time ago, but what has been its appeal to you personally? Well, um, uh, Rajiv, um, first of all, uh, the, the poem appealed to me because Buddha is very much part of our lives. You know, we are not Buddhist by any, I'm not a Buddhist by any stretch of imagination or a scholar of Buddhism, but you know, like all Indians, uh, captivated, enamored, fascinated uh, by the personality and the life of the Buddha, even if we don't always follow his teachings and his preachings. He's a historical figure, um, and he really was more than a spiritual and ethical figure. He was also a social revolutionary of his times who continued to inspire uh, very many people uh, in the 19th and 20th century in India and abroad. So yes, the poem fascinated me. I read the poem when I was very young. Uh, and over the years, I began to be more aware and more conscious of its extraordinary impact uh, in the West uh, and on figures like Vivekananda, Tagore, Gandhi, Nehru, and of course, Dr. Ambedkar, you know, who did much to revive um, the interest in Buddhism in late 20th century India. But you know, Edwin Arnold uh, Rajiv uh, is a fascinating figure in his own right. Um, you know, translated the Hitopadesha, translated the Gita Govinda, translated the Mahabharata. But for me, the most interesting thing of Edwin Arnold was the fact that it was his translation of the Bhagavad Gita 
uh, entitled the song Celestial, which became the defining text for Mahatma Gandhi. Uh, Gandhi read the Bhagavad Gita for the first time in its English translation uh, in 1889 or 1890 or thereabouts. And it remained with him till his very last. It was the one book that remained with him. And, you know, he would recommend this book to all his colleagues. He would recommend it to his family. Uh, you know, it, he would quote from it in his letters. Uh, and so Edwin Arnold, for me, became a very uh, interesting figure because not only for the poem that he wrote, the epic poem that he wrote, uh, which became a milestone in the rediscovery of India's Buddhist heritage, but also because of his translation of the Bhagavad Gita, uh, which became such a profoundly influential text uh, on, on Mahatma Gandhi and through Mahatma Gandhi on others. So as you said right at the beginning, this is a two-in-one biography. It's a biography of an epic poem. It's also the biography of the poet uh, who belonged to a generation uh, of Britishers uh, who were believers in British colonial rule in India, but at the same time were absolutely immersed in India's cultural uh, and uh, spiritual and literary legacies. You know, Max Muller, James Princip, Alexander Cunningham, uh, Edwin Arnold, they belong to that generation of the much maligned word today, but they really were Orientalists uh, in the best academic sense of the term. But you know, the challenge is really that, uh, you know, when you read the poem, and you don't know much about Edwin Arnold, as, as, as was the case when I first read the poem, uh, you know, you have a sense of uh, someone who is a mystic who's writing this and uh, who has experienced this, you know, the voice of a prophet uh, almost. And uh, of course, he's, uh, you know, he's writing for a Christian audience. So there is that great flavor of the biblical miracles and the, the texture and the tenor of it. And it's, uh, you know, it's very sort of Victorian poetry, uh, you know, the, the, the style and standard of that. And then you find out that, you know, here's a rather sort of, I mean, I, I hate to use the word prosaic, but in many ways, a prosaic man who's actually a journalist, uh, you know, does a job with the Telegraph, one of the British newspapers, and writes this in about seven or eight months, uh, you know, sort of scribbling notes on little pieces of paper. And uh, so there, there is this sort of very, there is this dichotomy between the expectation of the man and uh, what your very riveting book uh, revealed. I mean, it's unputdownable because it just moves relentlessly uh, from one engaging anecdote to the other. But, but Rahim, don't forget that here was a man, a prosaic man, an uninteresting man, no doubt. But here was a man who spent 26 months in India as principal of the Pune College, which later became the Deccan College, learned Sanskrit, learned Marathi, obviously had a felicity for languages. Uh, and here was a man who, before he wrote The Light of Asia in 1879, had translated, as I said, the Hitopadesha uh, and the Geet Govinda. Uh, so uh, he was, um, you know, he was a journalist, no doubt. He was not a scholar uh, in the Max Muller sense of the term. He was not an archaeologist. He was not a epigraphist like James Princip was. He brought in knowledge from different sources, uh, from French sources, English sources, Sanskrit sources, Pali sources. Uh, and, you know, he, 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 he told the story uh, of the life of the Buddha uh, in the Victorian way, to use your phrase. Uh, you know, there is something to poetry, Rajiv. Uh, the 19th century was the age of uh, epic poetry. Uh, and uh, if I may, if I just may make a comment, the poets were knighted by Queen Victoria. Uh, the authors were not. You don't have Sir Charles Dickens, <laughs> but you have Sir Edwin Arnold. You have Lord Tennyson. You know, poetry became the, the way of expressing uh, emotions related to empire, emotions related to culture, emotions related to civilization. Uh, it's no longer the case now. I, I, I agree with you. But the 19th century, I mean, you can't divorce uh, Edwin Arnold from the context of his times. This was a time of growing uh, religious uh, skepticism, 
this was a time in which there was growing disenchantment with the church and with the dogma of organized Christianity. This was an era in which scientific advance was challenging the very tenets of the Bible. Uh, and so Arnold represented you know, the, the, the spirit of his times. Uh, and through the life of the Buddha, I think he expressed uh, in many ways uh, his own personal philosophy, uh, you know, which was not rooted in organized Christianity, which was not organized, rooted in organized religion, but was actually rooted in a growing appreciation of the power of science, uh, the power of logic, the power of reason, the power of experimentation. Uh, and I think he found in Buddha uh, a figure, an ethical figure, uh, who didn't necessarily found a didn't it, you know a religion in the in the in the in the sense that we understand it today, but gave to the world a system of personal ethics, a system of personal morality, uh, which uh, I think uh, Arnold related to much more than say the Anglican Church or, or or the papacy for that matter. So an uninteresting man, no doubt, uh, but. Uh, a, a profoundly interesting figure uh, because of uh, you know the span with which he covered you know he uh, he, he covered buddhism he wrote on he translated the the sanskrit texts uh, he wrote uh, the 99 names of allah you know so he dabbled in various uh, various texts so he was a textual scholar in that sense of the term well, he also wrote, uh, you know, from to sort of elevate, to, to go beyond the light of Asia. He also wrote the light of the world, uh, which bombed, by the way. Yes. Which, you know, which was uh, which bombed, uh, which uh, you know, which didn't do well at all, and he was absolutely criticized <laughs> by the same people who were euphoric about the light of Asia. Uh, uh, incidentally, I see the light of Asia behind you. Uh, so <laughs> that's uh, you know, that's that's very much. A reflection of the fact that Buddha is, is part and parcel of our daily lives. Uh, yeah, the light of a, the light of the world was an epic poem on the life of Christ, which sank without a trace. Uh, unlike the light of Asia, which became a sensation uh, in England, in America, in Europe, and of course uh, in uh, all parts of Asia, got translated into twelve Indian languages, apart from, of course, European and other Asian languages as well. You also suggested that, uh, uh, you know, maybe that were the, to, to write uh, the light of the world was a pragmatic uh, move. Yes, he wanted to be the poet laureate. Uh, and I think he wanted to <laughs> appeal to the British <laughs> establishment by writing. Uh, Queen Victoria certainly wanted him, but I think the British establishment thought of him as too much of an Oriental poet. Uh, and an oriental author, you know, on oriental themes. So he wrote Light of the World. It didn't help his cause, certainly. But Rajiv, um, you know, you mentioned the fact that he's uninteresting, uh, but I do want to draw attention to the fact that he in many ways launched uh, with his uh, visit to Bodh Gaya in February of 1886. Uh, he launches the agitation uh, for the transfer of the Mahabodhi temple from the control of the Shivite priests, the Mahans, uh, to the Buddhist community. And this is a campaign that culminates in May of 1953 uh, with the control of the Mahabodhi temple passing to a management committee, 50% uh, of whom are Hindus and 50% of whom uh, represent the, the Buddhist community. So he's interesting because uh, he really is the one who launches the struggle, which others like Dharmapala and others take forward later for Buddhist control uh, over uh, the Mahabodhi temple. It's very much like the agitation in Ayodhya, uh, the agitation of the Hindus over uh, the Ram Janmabhumi, you know, so very much a parallel uh, to you know, to the Bodh Gaya movement, and I think that's what makes him uh, all all the more interesting. I didn't mean to diminish the man, uh, but it was just in terms of you know relative to the poem he wrote, and you know what it what it suggested or implied that the author might have sort of actually 
uh, engaged in the practices of Buddhism and, and, and speaking from deep insight in the, in the poem is, uh, uh, you know, that good. But, you know, I've uh, often wondered, uh, it's like, uh, in some ways, like uh, Buddhism in India, that we have uh, assimilated its symbols, yes. uh, but not uh, its principles. Yes, absolutely. No. And, and it is, in, and, and in, in, in many instances, you know, we read remarkable books, you know, Gandhiji's Experiments with Truth and uh, uh, other books, but they don't really have uh, a, a transformative impact. Uh, we're attracted to the book, we're attracted to the man. Uh, to what degree do you think, I mean, all these amazing people who, you know, from, who read the book and, and, and talk about it from uh, uh, Churchill, and was Churchill really impacted by it, C.V. Raman, Nehru, uh, Carnegie, uh, to what extent did the book really have an impact beyond at, you know, the time was ripe and uh, for, you know, Buddhism and there were people who were looking east and, and for, for the, the Buddhist idea to travel uh, to the West and yeah. then sort of around in different parts of the world. From 1879 till 1920, uh, there is no doubt that the light of Asia was very much the first text <clears throat> that many people would read to get an introduction to the life of the Buddha, not necessarily to Buddhism, but to the life of the Buddha. Uh, so it was. Uh, it it really is a milestone in that way in Buddhist uh, historiography, uh, because it's the one book that popularizes. I mean, it's not an original piece of work. Scholars have picked holes in uh, in the poem, uh, factually, historically, epigraphically, archaeologically. But I think uh, this book did uh, much more than any other single piece of work uh, to popularize the life of the Buddha. And, and not only in the West, uh, but also in places like Ceylon, in places like Thailand, Japan, and of course, in India. But let me, let me say this, uh, Rajiv, that, you know, there were two sets of people, uh, there are two, two di distinct strands uh, of people uh, who reacted to this poem differently. Uh, the majority uh, of in whom I would include Vivekananda, Tagore, Gandhi, Nehru, C.V. Raman, everybody, looked upon Buddha as a cultural, uh, spiritual, ethical, philosophical icon. But there was another group, uh, and this was largely in India, uh, starting with uh, Jyotiba Phule uh, in Pune in the mid 19th century, Narayana Guru uh, in Kerala, and then, of course, Dharmanand Kosambi, our greatest scholar of Pali, and ultimately Dr. Ambedkar, who saw Buddha not through the lens of culture or ethics or spirituality, but saw Buddha through the lens of social revolution and social change, and saw Buddha as a person who took on the prejudices of the day namely the caste prejudices, the, uh, the prejudice, uh, uh, you know, which led to animal sacrifice, you know, this whole notion of ahimsa and tolerance and compassion. Now, I think the dominant impression we carry of Buddha uh, is the former, the cultural, the ethical, the philosophical icon. Uh, the Ambedkar view of Buddha, the Dharmanand Kosambi view of Buddha as a social revolutionary, is something that I don't think uh, has deeply permeated our consciousness. So in that in one way that explains the paradox which you say that we have adopted the symbols of the Buddha without necessarily adopted the adopting the principles and the practices that the Buddha epitomized. I mean, our national symbol uh, is the Sarnath Four Lions, uh, the national flag as the Dharma Chakra. So the symbols of Buddha permeate the Indian nation state. Uh, but has the life of the Buddha made a substantial and significant difference uh, to our notions of social equality, uh, to our notions of uh, brotherhood? I'm afraid, no. I mean, they, they, that, that's, the, that's the great tragedy in our lives, you know. In fact, that has been, the, in a sense, the soft underbelly of Buddhism, 
that it's only with people in, in recent history, people like Thich Nhat Hanh and just very few on the global stage uh, who have sort of uh, brought into the discourse the idea of engaged, uh, engaged uh, Buddhism. Uh, it, it also, uh, it's, you know, just to stay a little bit further with the with this amazing, uh, amazing uh, poem, that uh, uh, it dwells on uh, the life of the Buddha rather than Buddhism. Yes, you rightly say. Yes, and uh, even people like uh, Vivekananda was at one point to say that you know the Buddha is my Ishta and Ramakrishna is my master, and uh, and interestingly that. Uh, uh, when uh, Ramakrishna uh, passed away, um, Vivek Vivekananda went into deep meditation about the future of uh, the mission. And so the Ramakrishna mission was modeled on the basis of the Buddhist Sangha, which elected its, uh, uh, its head and its leadership. And so I, I was really wondering that all, all these amazing people who read the book, uh, you see traces of that, you know, certainly in, in, in T.S. Eliot's work, more than traces. But uh, when you look at many of the other sort of big names, and, and, and you know, you've doc documented them so vividly in the book, is that uh, uh, where does, uh, it, it, was it just a novel poem that they read and, and, and thought it was wonderful and evocative and, you know, you read a poem and it doesn't transform you? <clears throat> Or was it something that really impacted them? Well, I think, um, you know, Gandhi's intro introduction to Buddhism, uh, certainly Nehru's introduction to Buddhism, um, certainly the introduction of people like Vivekananda to Buddhism came through uh, a reading of the light of Asia. But uh, take the example of C.V. Raman, uh, Rajiv. Now, here's a man who wins the Nobel Prize in physics in 1930 and goes to Stockholm. Uh, and uh, in his speech says that I have been influenced in my life by three books. The first book was by a German physicist called Helmholtz. That is natural for a person who has won the Nobel Prize in physics. The second, the second book was Euclid's Geometry, which every school child has struggled with, which you have struggled with, I have struggled with, uh, and which any scientist uh, would always uh, you know, use as part of his arsenal. And he then says that the third book that has influenced me most profoundly is The Light of Asia, because it is by reading about the life of Buddha that I learned the values of compassion, tolerance, understanding, uh, you know, social empathy. Uh, so here was an example of a, of a man uh, who was not a, who not a public figure, not an author, not a literary or artistic figure, but who was a scientist. Uh, who publicly announces in Stockholm that this is one of the three books. The two books are on science and the third book is The Light of Asia. Uh, so there are, there are people who um, uh, were inspired by this book. I mean, take the, the, for example, in Kerala, the entire SNDP movement of Narayana Guru uh, is inspired by the life of the Buddha. Uh, and uh, Narayana Guru first comes into contact with the life of the Buddha by reading uh, this poem, both in English and later on in its Malayalam translation. So you're absolutely right. People did not learn of Buddhism by reading the poem. People learned of the life of the Buddha by reading the poem. So I think that's why at the end of the book, I say that the book became a phenomenon and it became a sensation and has remained one because it focuses on the humanity of Buddha. It doesn't focus on the divinity of Buddha. You know, so he humanizes the Buddha through his entire life. Birth, Siddhartha, the prince, the search for renunciation, and then of course, <clears throat> you know, his preachings towards the end. So uh, this poem really, uh, if you talk to a scholar on Buddhism today, uh, half of them would not have heard of this poem and the other half would say, oh, it's a 150 year old poem. Uh, but the fact of the matter is, Rajiv, in the 20th century, it gets translated into Hindi, Malayalam, Tamil, Telugu, Kannada, Uriya, Punjabi, Assamese, Sindhi, Punjabi, and largely because the social 
messaging of the Buddha. The, the authors were trying to propagate the message of social reform, uh, social revolution, and they saw Buddha not through the lens of meditation and contemplation, but saw Buddha through the lens of a social revolution. And I, that aspect of the Buddha, I think, uh, has got suppressed in our society. You know, ironically, do you think the fact that, uh, you know, the book uh, had a tagline, the great renunciation? Um, yes. And, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> absolutely. And certainly, it's, you know, all it's the, in fact, C.V. Raman says in his Stockholm speech uh, that the what inspired him was the great renunciation. <laughs> Siddhartha. So, but, you know, to Ambedkar and to Narayana Guru and to Kosambi, it's not the great renunciation, but it's the, it's, it's what the Buddha does through his teachings, what he preaches. Uh, and in any case, uh, Kosambi and, uh, and Ambedkar reject the notion that Siddhartha saw an old man, saw a corpse, uh, you know, saw a cripple, uh, saw a monk, uh, and then decided on the path of renunciation. You know, this is a more Marxist interpretation. You know, the Sakyas were fighting the Koliyas uh, over control of the Rohini River, uh, which separated them. Uh, and Siddhartha tried to mediate. He didn't want war, uh, but the Koliyas and the Sakyas were intent on fighting with each other and frustrated with his inability to bring about peace. Siddhartha goes on a path of renunciation, goes into voluntary self-exile. Now, that's not a traditional Buddhist view. That's not a view that is embedded in mainstream Buddhism, but that's a view that is taken uh, by a large number of people who look at Buddha uh, from the lens of a social revolution, which is what Ambedkar did, you know, uh, after the 1930s. You know, I think the, the, the Buddha would have been very comfortable with, with, with all of this uh, himself, uh, because I think that, uh, uh, you know, the recognition that uh, there is myth, there is legend, and, uh, you know, these, these stories take particular forms and shapes uh, to articulate uh, perspectives and nuances, and which need not necessarily be true. Uh, yes. You know, in the Mahayana tradition, uh, you know, the, 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 it's believed, for example, that uh, the Buddha said that everything I have taught uh, needs to be subject uh, to reason and logic and experience. And that is what should finally prevail. And interestingly, I, I mentioned the, the Mahayana uh, largely because uh, uh, you know, the poem is supposedly, uh, you know, based on the Lalita Vistra, Vistara Sutra, which is a Sanskrit uh, sutra, which brings together diverse sources in particular the Mahayana sources. So when you look at the contents page of the text, it, it each time uh, refers to the Bodhisattva. Yes. And the Bodhisattva, this the Bodhisattva, Bodhisattva, Bodhisattva. And, uh, and, and it is in, in, in the Bodhisattva ideal, which I, I'm not sure. I mean, it's been a long time since I read the, the poem, that this social dimension uh, manifests itself. And uh, it's something that I don't know, may have missed in his, uh, in, his, in his poem. Absolutely, absolutely. I think, you know, uh, Arnold in his poem really is in the mainstream view of renunciation, meditation, contemplation, you know, that type of a thing. Whereas the social dimensions uh, of the life of the Buddha and the preachings of the Buddha uh, is, uh, is, is, is missing in the poem. Incidentally, you just mentioned about logic and reason, Rajiv. Uh, you know, Arnold went to Japan in 1892, uh, and in a speech that he gave to the Buddhist society uh, in Tokyo, actually points to the fact that one of the reasons why he got captivated by the life of the Buddha, and he wrote this poem, was because he saw absolutely no contradiction between science and logic and reason on the one hand, and the life and the teachings of Buddha on the other. He was hinting that there was a contradiction when it came uh, to Christianity, uh, you know, but he, he, in fact, talks of the convergence. Uh, and remember, we are talking of 1892. He talked of the convergence of science and reason and logic uh, with what uh, the Buddha was preaching. Uh, and so it's, uh, it's very 
it's a, it, it, I think that's one very important reason why Arnold uh, decides to popularize the life of the Buddha, uh, because he's also sending a message, uh, not just on the life of, a, of an iconic figure in India, but also that uh, you can be uh, you can be an ethical icon, a spiritual icon, a philosophical icon, but yet, uh, you know, remain embedded in modern science, uh, modern logic, modern reasoning. And I think that's the reason why Buddha appeals uh, to Vivekananda, to Raman, to Tagore, to Gandhi. And I don't, not so much Gandhi, because Gandhi and science, you know, were quite, uh, you know, quite far apart. But certainly Nehru, for example. Uh, I think uh, they were all people profoundly moved by, uh, by the fact that, uh, uh, you know, the Buddha did not become the Buddha by following a Buddha. Uh, Buddha said, be your own lamp, be your own searcher, be your own experiment. And in fact, uh, you know, I was rereading Ambedkar's uh, The Buddha and His Dhamma. And there's a very nice phrase in that, uh, Rajiv. Uh, he said, Buddha said, I am not a moksha data, I am a marga data. I think that's a very, very telling line. You know, I am not a moksha data, uh, but I am a marga data. Uh, and I think that's, uh, that's what set uh, the Buddha apart from founders of all other religions, you know, who claimed divine status for themselves. I think it's interesting that uh, as uh... Buddhism continues to sort of unfold in uh, different uh, parts of the world. Uh, Buddhism has demonstrated a remarkable ability to be assimilated. Yes, absolutely. Whereas in Hinduism, we've had the ability to assimilate. And, and, and that has been its, uh, its uh, enormous uh, strength and vitality. And in keeping with what we've been talking about, that uh, in the West, there is this sort of growing uh, tradition or movement of the secularization of Buddhism, secular Buddhism. So you take from Japanese and Tibetan Buddhism primarily, the method, the techniques and practices, and you, uh, you sort of uh, isolate them from the rituals and the belief systems, even reincarnation for that matter. I mean, I'm not sure I, I, I sort of empathize or understand that. And, and, and to achieve that as a, as, as, as a new form of, uh, uh, of Buddhism, and uh, uh, so I, I think that the, uh, uh, the aspiration of the poem, and he does refer to, uh, you know, the Buddha as the Lord, the great sort of reverence, uh, almost, you know, divine-like in, in the way that he's, he's, uh, he's portrayed. And the, the, the other thing that emerges uh, from the poem, and, you know, you have, you have very sort of skillfully uh, woven that uh, into your narrative is that you know the the, the Lalita Vistara really you know translates as the play in full or the extensive play. So yeah. in a sense that uh, this was uh, the Mahana view that uh, the Buddha's last incarnation was like a performance uh, in order to teach people about the path, and it wasn't sort of real in that sense. It was yeah. you know, the Maya or the, or, or the illusion of it. And, uh, uh, and, and, and the play sort of antidotes that perspective at one level, but because of its very style, as a, you know, it's, it sort of it, it evokes that aspect of the large and the grandeur of the performance. And uh, you know, I was so inspired by a book that I, you know, I decided to revisit the film that, uh, uh, that, that the Germans and, 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 and Rai and uh, uh, his wife had made. And that, that has these elements of, grandeer, yes. and the elephants and, 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 and what have you. And so the irony was, and, and is that uh, uh, here is, 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 is a tale of renunciation, of austerity, which juxtaposes on this huge canvas of grandeur. Absolutely. I mean, you know, um, one, of the great, one of the great contributions of the poem, uh, Raji, of course, is that in the last book, uh, the book is, you know, the poem is 50,000 lines, but in the last part of the, uh, of the poem, um, Arnold gives a completely different interpretation to the concept of Nirvana. You know, the concept of Nirvana was seen as a nihilistic, negative, uh, life negating uh, concept. And I think 
the poem was one of the early efforts uh, attempts at giving a a much more um, dynamic a much more positive uh, orientation uh, to the idea of nirvana going back to the original pali uh, teachings which exemplified uh, buddha's uh, initial uh, teachings and i mean it's sort of be in the world but not of the world uh, you know i mean there's a there's a big distinction between saying uh, nirvana means give up everything uh, you know be complete negate everything uh, withdraw into your own shell and do your own thing and there's a difference between that and saying be in the world uh, but not necessarily be attached uh, you know um, you know be don't be of the world so this this concept of of nirvana Uh, is something that uh, completely gets a new dimension uh, once the poem gets published and then of course you know other other people other authors describe this but you know i would as i you know as as you said right at the beginning uh, this is not the poem is not uh, an introductory primer to buddhism uh, it's just a it's a narrative about the life of the buddha you know in victorian poetry i mean this type of poetry is long gone out of vogue i mean it's uh, no longer the practice to pro- to pro- uh, to produce epic poems of this type but it's interesting that you know it gets translated into almost all indian languages uh, and uh, it doesn't get translated in prose rajiv it gets translated uh, in poetry you know in hindi for example uh, in malayalam uh, in tamil and all many other indian languages and that's of course because of the social dimension of buddhism you know look people the authors the poets looked upon the buddha uh, as a figure of social transformation and not necessarily as a person uh, who told you to meditate and contemplate and you know withdraw from the world but you know ramesh what i think what the uh, two things one uh, is that uh, you know i'm not particularly fluent in any other indian like in any indian language i say that would be very biased but i mean i can read uh, and, and understand uh, hindi but uh, not uh, hindi poetry i wonder i wonder how how a successfully translates into other languages uh, something that was so in you well, know the hindi hindi was done by uh, one of the greatest poets uh, of the hindi language ramchandra shukla uh it was a very influential uh, translation very influential the marathi was not uh, it was not in poetry it was in prose uh the bengali was in poetry <clears throat> and of course the telugu was in poetry malayalam was in poetry tamil was in poetry um uh, you know uh, of course they you know they abridged the 50000 lines uh, it's not a complete free flowing translation i would say it's a trans creation you know taking the essential message uh, of of the buddha the, particularly the last uh, book book the eighth which deals with his uh, four noble truths the eightfold path and the concept of nirvana and so on and so forth uh, so the influence in india uh, rajiv is largely because of uh, the translations because you know the the english was read by a very narrow segment of the indian population uh, in the early 20th century but it became popular uh, largely through uh, through the translations i i also remain uncomfortable with this uh, sort of divorcing uh, the buddha from buddhism <laughs> because there are two you know there are two sort of uh, key figures in india sort of spiritual history one is ramakrishna and of course who's uh, who sadhanas and who's journey uh were very uh, uh carefully documented and uh, i think that was also the case uh, i mean maybe it's myth or legend but the buddha's journey was very carefully uh documented uh, to demonstrate the path uh and so in the nalanda tradition for example uh, it was the juxtaposition of wisdom and method and so the buddha's life is the teaching both of the wisdom of the man and the method and all the practices uh, that he went through and, and and one of the sort of uh, challenges that western authors have had uh, writing in english and have now put us in a spot is that they have translated translated dukkha as suffering and yeah. from that has followed a whole world view of what buddhism is and i think you know maybe unsatisfactoriness or whatever 
and they have uh, translated uh, uh, it as you know the, the craving uh, as as desire, uh, and again that is that has different kinds of uh, connotations. But uh, I, I you know I I I think that uh, all of us interested in Buddhism are so deeply grateful to you uh, for this book uh, because it, it it has really brought alive. Uh, both uh, the, the writing of it, uh, the man who wrote it, uh, and its wisdom, even if you disagree uh, with, you know, the wisdom that it's putting it putting out. But, you know, I, I, as a struggling, failing author, I, I did, what is your research methodology? How on earth? I mean, this is like a panchatantra, you know, kaleidoscope, and it always falls so marvelously in place. How do you do it? <laughs> Thank you, Rajiv. Rajiv, let me just say one thing that, you know, uh, I make a conscious distinction between Buddha and Buddhism because, uh, frankly, I am, uh, you know, I am very, very, very. Uh, I get worried by any ism, by any ism, you know, because you know, there's there's an element of institutionalization, there's an element of dogma, there's an element of you know, uh, coercion, uh, there's an element of certainty. Uh, for me, uh, the Buddha represents. As you, as you yourself said, uh, you know, he represents a path, uh, you know, which you follow and search for yourself. That's why uh, I know Buddhists uh, and Buddhist scholars may not be happy, but I keep saying uh, that uh, I distinguish personally uh, between uh, the Buddha and Buddhism, whereas I'm, I may not be a follower or practitioner of Buddhism, but I am certainly, uh, I would say, you know, the man, the person who's been most profoundly uh, affected by uh, affected me uh, is the life of the Buddha, you know, and the Buddha's teachings. I'm still interested in you. I do. I too have this behind. <laughs> me. <laughs> going back to my sort of penultimate question, and uh, how you know what is your research methodology? I mean, you have just done such amazing work from PhD theses that have been you know recently. Well, uh, you just have to. You know, if you love your subject, Rajiv, you will do this. Uh, you know, uh, this, I, I wrote, I write books not from the head. I write books from the heart. It's people whom I, whom I really relate to that I really write. And, you know, in today's day and age, uh, archives are open all across the world. You have digital access, mostly free. Sometimes you have to pay. Uh, so the vast amounts of information available. Uh, in university archives, in national archives, and across the world. So you will, you will be surprised. Uh, I wrote this book uh, beginning April 2020. I didn't stir out of my study from where I am speaking. Uh, I didn't have to visit a single archive because I, I consulted British archives, uh, French archives, German archives, Vatican archives, American archives, Russian archives, and of course, the Indian archives, all digitally, Rajiv. So it's all there, uh, uh, pr provided you have the, the stamina. And ultimately, you must have the inner urging, you know, to, uh, you must have that, that urge. But you can't get away from uh, uh, us or me celebrating uh, your skill and your tenacity. I mean, to write a letter to somebody who is a specialist on, on Queen Victoria, you know, identified that she had the book in her library and had she actually read it. <laughs> <laughs> well, I do. Well, yes, you know, no, no. Congratulations. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> I would have to, you know, yeah, I mean, I do, I do a lot of, you know, writing biographies is like, you know, you have to be a Sherlock Holmes, you know, you have to look at multiple clues, you have to follow multiple leads, sometimes they are dead ends. Sometimes they give you uh, gold at the end of the trail. Uh, yeah, I mean, so I enjoy writing these books. You know, that's the main thing. You know, I, I do it for enjoyment, Rajiv. You know, I do it for learning. I do it for enjoyment. And I'm so happy that people like you, you know, who, who are more immersed in, in the world of uh, Buddhism and uh, Buddhist thought. And, you know, and by the way, I was extraordinarily lucky uh, to and privileged, actually, to have a foreword by the Dalai Lama, who in many ways uh, represents, uh, I mean, he is the, if today people talk of Buddha or Buddhism, the normal one person who comes to mind uh, is the Dalai Lama. So I was really privileged to have him write the foreword for this book. And it meant a lot to me, actually. 
So, I mean, even as I sort of went while, while, while celebrating you, I have to ask you a, a personal question. How does a person with your sensibility and your erudition and your passion, how do you cope with the life of a politician? Be in politics, but not off <laughs> politics. <laughs> well said. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much. That's Thank this, you. Uh, the conversation and the book have been great learning experiences. So it's a delight, delight to talk to you. Gratitude, deep celebration of you. And I guess it's a standard classical, classic, archetypical question. What's your next book? Thank you. Well, uh, still thinking about it. Not yet, not yet uh, final. So I have various ideas floating around in my mind, but not yet, you know, not yet final. Good luck. We're waiting. And Thanks, Rajiv. Thank Thanks. you very much.